Holistic Health Show. My name is Dawn Boxel, and I am excited to talk about another topic that is um, one that I feel like I hear on a daily basis when I see patients. And it has to do with your appetite returning after weight loss surgery. Um, everyone always seems so perplexed and how is it possible that my appetite is back? Um, and what am I doing wrong? Because I'm trying things and it doesn't seem to work. So um, I'm gonna go into uh, some of this I've already talked about. You, if you've listened to my podcast before, some of this um, will be a refresher. Um, but then I also have some new information that is going to be super helpful in allowing you to really dig deeper into you as a person to see um, what really may be driving it. So let's get started. So six reasons your appetite returns after weight loss surgery. So first, first, the easiest, I always like to start with the easiest first. So if someone is really coming in and they are struggling with their appetite, they have um, not done well with the um, reduction in their appetite, they really just feel like they're struggling. Um, it may be early on after surgery, um, it may be way down the road. Um, usually after weight loss surgery, uh, you know, sleeve gastrectomy, ruin white gastric bypass, you are going to see kind of a, uh, it's going to take a nosedive, that ghrelin level, that hunger hormone is going to take a nosedive and flatline. That's what we typically see. But I will tell you, we have patients that come in um, and they are hungry and they do have an appetite. So it isn't perfect for all of you. And um, even as time evolves, I find that some, um, they did have a suppression in their appetite, um, but then it did come back later. So let's talk about some of the basics of what things really drive it. So first, I always start with the simplest first, food. If you are really eating more refined carbohydrates or grains, you're eating more packaged processed foods, you are going to have a bigger appetite because it's not gonna keep you full uh, long enough. Um, and if you're not getting enough protein, enough fiber or enough fat, that can drive that increase in hunger. So make that a priority. If you, first off, if you find that, hey, guess what? I'm hungry, then check your protein, check your fiber, check your healthy fats. Um, and then make sure you're not doing too many of those packaged foods, those refined grains, um, and that will help. The next one is movement. Some of, some of the times it's because you've really just changed your exercise and maybe you're really doing more intense workouts and you just need a little more fuel. Doesn't mean you know 500 calories, but you might need an additional um, 100 or two calories to start and see how you feel um, by bumping it up a little bit and um, then reevaluate. But sometimes that increase in movement or your act, act you know, you're burning more calories and you're, you are um, incre increasing that demand, then um, your fuel uh, needs go up as well. Um, then third one is stress. And I know I've done whole podcasts on, on stress um, and this is no different. Anytime that you have more demands in your life, you are saying yes when you should be saying no, um, or just life events happen out of um, your control that you really had no control over, um, guess what? It increases your desire or your um, appetite for for more refined carbohydrates. Um, they find that people who have you know, a higher stress level, they do crave those crunchy, um, salty snacks and sometimes even sweet snacks. Um, so that stress level could be driving it. So if something recently has happened that maybe you, um, you know, you're just in it and there's not a whole lot you can do to change it, you're just in it. Then you gotta be hyper aware of how can I take care of myself during this time? Because that's when um, things can really get off track if you don't keep yourself a priority. 
Uh, no matter how hard it is, sometimes you have to take, you know, five minutes here and 10 minutes there just to um, have some quiet time. Maybe it's a journal um, or a meditation or um, a bath. So you find what works for you, but you've got to get that stress in check. Um, sleep is another one. If you're getting less than six hours of sleep, they find that the next day your hunger goes up and you are going to want to eat more food. Um, number five is gut bacteria. Uh, my whole website is covered with all kinds of information with gut bacteria. So if you've fixed your food, you've evaluated your movement to make sure you don't need to bump your calories up a little bit, you're working on your stress, you're working on your sleep, and you're still struggling with that appetite, and you really feel like, I'm just hungry, I need food. Um, you could think about your gut bacteria. If you have too many bad bacteria and not enough good bacteria, it's what we call dysbiosis or an imbalance in that gut bacteria. And that will drive more cravings and especially for those um, carby, sweet, uh, snacky things, you are going to uh, be driven to eat more of those uh, because of that bacteria really wanting to be fed. So they need food. And when the wrong guys take over in your gut, guess what? They make you crave the wrong foods. So you will be more drawn to those snacky things and those more refined carbohydrates um, on a regular basis. Then if you've kind of exhausted all these and you're still struggling with that hunger, you might want to think about your genetics. So these are really cool to me. Um, I know that this, to me, this is the missing piece um, that I feel like uh, I've needed to really help someone make, you know, the permanent changes that they need to really understand how their body works. So I'm, I'm super excited about sharing all these different genetic pieces with you each week so that you get a little more educated and understand that, you know what, um, it is not that I don't have willpower. It's not that I am weak and it's not that I'm a, um, a failure or I've not been successful, um, which, you know, that, is, that should never be the focus anyway. but reality is to you guys it is you to you you do feel those things those are very real feelings um, so it's easy for a clinician that's working with you to just not believe you to say ah, are you really are you really logging all your food are you sure you're eating well uh, are you, really did you really exercise enough I mean are you working out hard um, or are you just kind of strolling on that walk um, you know and, and you know the sleep and stress I would say that probably doesn't get asked as much enough um, but uh, and then the gut bacteria that definitely doesn't get asked either but I would definitely say the food and the movement are ones that health professionals usually do use as a guide. If someone's coming in saying, I'm hungry, um, they're thinking that um, you know, you're not doing your part. And really, it could be just your genetics. Now, there are hundreds of genes. And um, the genetic tests that I use, we really focus on pathways. We really focus on just um, a combination of, of genetics. So we don't focus on one, we focus on a group of them and how they interact together. So it's more about your biology and what's really happening um, at the cellular level so that you, and you know, even at the systems, your body systems, so that how they interact, that really could be driving it. So I'm gonna highlight some of um, the hungry genes, the sugar craving genes, and the reward genes um, that we find are associated with um, obesity, overweight, um, you know, more weight loss resistance, um, those increase in appetite. So any of those type of genetics is what I'm talking about. So some hungry genes. Um, MC4R, this one is um, very common where you will have weaker satiety signals. So you don't feel that strong urge to stop eating. 
um, and you'll typically have more calorie intake. So you're going to be more, have more affinity to eating, just continuing to eat food. Um, FTO, this was really the first obesity gene that they recognized. And um, you, typically with this gene, you have a de decrease in responsiveness to satiety. So very similar with the MC4R, you're having those weaker signals where this one is you just don't respond um, to fullness. And then APOA2, this one increases um, ghrelin that hunger hormone, and then also increases your, your desire to eat more food. So these is what we would consider hungry genes. So if you have those, um, one or a combination of them, or maybe you have a couple of them and um, even some of the sugar craving genes, guess what? It is gonna be harder for you to really, um, you know, have control over that just at your genetic makeup. That doesn't mean there aren't solutions and that we can't go a little further upstream and kind of block some of these um, or turn them off or silence them. So now you don't have that drive to eat um, or that affinity for sugar foods. So FAAH is one that is um, associated with sugar cravings and you have an increased reward with sugar. So those, anytime you have sugar, your um, signals back to your brain are, um, you know, hypersensitive and they are really lighting up uh, the reward center of your brain and making you say, this is good. And it reminds you of that feeling. It gives you that boost in your mood. So then guess what? You want to do it again. Um, TAS2R38. All these crazy genetic um, names, I know. But this one is more about taste receptors. And this one, you actually have an aversion to bitter tasting things. So guess what? If you don't like bitter tasting things, you are going to be more drawn to more sugary things. So um, that makes it a little more difficult um, and you have to kind of um, utilize different strategies to prevent that. Um, SLC2A2, this one is another one that they find have an increase in a sugar intake. And a lot of these here with the hungry genes and the sugar cravings and the reward, they do have to do with your mood and behavior as well. Um, it can even be lumped in the addiction area. So if you really feel like you are struggling and you've struggled your whole life and then you, know, you have weight loss surgery and you have su some success, and um, now some of those things are coming back, you get freaked out and feel like, oh gosh, I'm gonna go right back to where I am. Um, but the reality is you don't have to. There are solutions. There are things that you can do. Um, understanding your genetics um, does give you some pretty powerful information that you may or may not like. So if you do find that, hey, I have all these hungry genes and all these sugar craving genes and they are on at a very high, um, um, you know, ability to, to express, then um, you, you do have to make different choices. You, you are going to have to um, not have as many cheat days. You can't allow yourself to get off track for too long um, because you could easily go back to that because of these genetics. Um, the last one is the reward genes. Um, the DRD2, you see more of an increase in binge eating. Um, the clock gene, which actually changes your eating behavior, it has to do with your circadian rhythm. So that one can tie in with sleep. Um, we find that if you have that clock gene and you don't get you know, that seven to eight hours of sleep or less than the six hours of sleep that next day, you are going to be more hungry because of that. And you're going to struggle to not eat. So if you are really struggling with your appetite and you feel like it's back, uh, I, something is broken, it is back, and I went for a whole year, I went for five years, I went for 15 years, 
and now my appetite is back. What's happened? This is where you may want to think about, you know, all these basic things. Did you just have life happen and you just need to really refocus and kind of re-implement these basic things of your food, your movement, you know, working on your stress and sleep and gut bacteria? Or is it really that something has triggered um, a gene to turn back on? And we need to figure out which one and we need to go upstream and silence it again. Um, so that's where I think if you really are struggling and you aren't getting resolution with moving through these um, six steps, then um, you definitely want to consider genetics and how that is playing a role in then understanding how to um, go around that so that you can stay successful long term. So I hope that has helped and I hope that these genetic snips that I'm reading are not confusing. Um, don't get too hung up on the um, you know, acronym that I give for them. Just focus on the combination of them and how they really interact with your body. Ooh, ooh, ooh.